and welcome you back for segment number two or segment one of the Friday Five, as the case may be. We are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, and joined in studio by the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who was not outranked, but definitely outflanked. By I was Colonel, outflanked, yeah. Colonel Lene Johnson. <laughs> she did a very good job. Impressive lady. And then when uh, Mike Height walked in, we had the sergeant, the admiral, and the colonel. And we know who outranks everybody. The sergeant does. Working folk. That's right. The working folk. Mr. Height, welcome Work back. Horses. Welcome. Thank Pe- you very much. People Good ask to be me. Here. They say, is Mike Height leaving the show? Where, where, <laughs> where's he been? He's only been on like once in the last couple of weeks. What's, what happened? Where did he go? I said, I don't know. He's ashamed of it. So. I get a text from this. Says, I can't do it this Friday. Right. I get another text. I can't do it that Friday either. Like, what's going on here? I'm thinking he's going all cheetah on us, Bill. No, no. I'm here for the next two Fridays, at least. At least? At least. Maybe okay. longer. Also, Mr. Carl, Michael Carl, longest tenured member of the group. Good morning, sir. Great to be here, folks. Wonderful to have you. Mr. Lawrence Schultz. It's a wonderful day in the eastern panhandle. <laughs> Even though we're getting a little rain, uh, everybody tells me we have a drought. So yeah. it might cure it to some extent. A little late for the farmers, I'm sorry to say. It is. It is. Didn't get the second cutting this year. We really needed it in the western part of the state. The western and central part of the state were hit the hardest with the drought. Um, I talked to some some other legislators, and they said the creeks, rivers were dried up, and it, they were in really, really bad shape. So this will help. On top of everything else, it's bad for the fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Via I mean, telephone, dead fish don't don't take the bait, you know. Via telephone, David Valente is in the Joe Peretti chair today, Mr. Valente. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, Good morning, morning to you, sir. From Mr. Joe Ferretti in Georgia. The storm was scary. The eye of the storm went over my house as a Cat 1, now a tropical storm. I did not sleep last night due to fear of falling trees. Penny and I slept on the ground floor, 80 mile per hour gusts. I'm sure Florida is a mess. We are 300 miles from the Florida coast, and it's bad here with flooding and wind damage. Mm. That's from Joe Ferretti in Georgia uh, Mm. this morning. Well, if he's listening today, we're all thinking about you, Joe. Our thoughts and prayers. Yeah, and uh, he didn't mention whether or not they have power or not, but I think I heard up to 2 million people now without power between Georgia and Florida. And, again, the folks that decided to weather it out, staying in the the big bend of Florida, I'm not sure why they would do that, not with storm surge, as we were talking about earlier. Storm surge is going to wipe out everything. Mm-hmm. I saw that the um, local police issued a, a Facebook message or some other kind of public announcement that if you're going to resist evacuating, please take a permanent marker, write your name and date of birth yeah. and other personal information <laughs> on your body. Yeah. That, that yeah. was a news story we yeah. ran yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, that is uh, completely true. <coughs> After I cough, I didn't turn my head mic, so no exam necessary. We began and our... Go a little <laughs> something like this. Hit it. We ring in a new Friday, the best way we remember on this particular Friday is, of course, the last one of September. Last Friday, it was still summer. I hope you enjoyed it. But now it's fall, so break out that pumpkin. It's time to deploy it. Remember the droughts? It made for a dry old scene. Well, that's all changed now, thanks to Helene. The Friday crew has returned in a similar fashion, still writing checks that their mouths are still cashing. (laughs) Mike Carl returns. No partners meeting today for him. Mike Heights here now, but this weekend he's being called to work by Big Jim. But when are you leaving for that, by the way? Uh, I'll leave sometime Saturday. David Valente is in the Ferretti chair, a chair by the phone, and that makes Larry Schultz the remaining Democrat here all alone. Bill Stubblefield's in the House representing Tennessee. That makes four of our five. That's 80% a solid B. As usual, a lot has happened since we were last on. Donald Trump declared that Ukraine is pretty much gone. That was news to President Volodymyr Zelensky, I'm afraid, who was meeting with Biden and Harris and getting more aid. Joe Manchin weighed in with all the courage he could muster and said he can't endorse Harris over her stance on the filibuster. He also hasn't endorsed Trump, and I guess that's fine, but who's left to endorse? Mountain Party candidate Jill Stein? Beginning September 30, the legislature will go into a special session. This was at the behest of the governor who made the suggestion. The main topics appear to be a tax cut, child care legislation, and supplemental appropriations. But can West Virginia afford this when you consider future obligations? This past week, the Stebblefield Institute hosted a night for AI. Now that's a subject that can scare you, and they don't even have to try. 
Most of my exposure to AI is from the movie War Games, you see. That starred Matthew Broderick and I believe Ali Sheedy. That movie came out in 1983 and exposed what AI might doom if computers determined that we all deserved a nuclear boom. But did you know in that same year, that whole movie nearly came true? And we have a Soviet Air Force officer for whom we must say thank you. Stanislav Petrov is his name, and in 1983, on September 26, he saw something he didn't like. He saw an incoming missile on his radar that many thought was a U.S. first strike. Not only did he see one missile, he then saw four more, and then ignored direct orders to retaliate quickly and even the score. Petrov passed on nuking the free world and causing unjust terror, all because he did not believe what turned out to be missiles in error. So 41 years and one day later, we all need to be glad that one communist soldier was a responsible comrade. Maybe if AI was in charge, that launch would have occurred, and human controls in place to stop nuclear mistakes would not have deferred. So next time you're at home and you want to hug your mommy, think of why that's possible. Stanislav Petrov, the responsible commie. <laughs> I never heard that story, Rob. Yeah, that's... <laughs> True, nice. true story. Yeah, a little yeah. history there for us. I'm here to inform. If like I can it. do so, we're entertaining a bonus. Yeah, yeah. Stanislav Petrov. You know, and there's a similar story with Cuban blockade, and uh, one of the commanding officers of a of a one of the Russian ships did not take action when he was directed to do so, and that would have kicked off a the Third World War. So there's at least two Russian military folks that defied what they're supposed to do and we're uh, we're living in peace today well that, that was the whole premise of the war games yeah. movie is is that the 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 individuals that were supposed to launch didn't and it was the americans in the movie um were supposed to to turn the push the button and refuse to do it and that's why they put the ai machine in place is because they wanted to take the human error out of it we begin with issue number one, and on that, Mr. David Valente in the leadoff chair. All right, good morning. Uh, so Tuesday night is debate number two, which is the vice presidential debate between Tim Walls and uh, J.D. Vance. Uh, so does this debate really matter? To, in, in the grand scheme of things with this race, uh, so relatively close race, will this debate matter? Um and as a bonus question, should the candidates be engaging in a vice to show their commitment to being vice president? <laughs> I, I, I was going to lodge you for not having a lengthy setup, but your last line there kind of brought you back down into the muck. <laughs> All right, uh, let's start with uh, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield on this one. Bill? I think it will matter. I think, like everything, it's going to be on the edges because the uh, most people have their mind made up. There's only a very small group of uh, truly undecided. Uh, but as we've discussed before, as my good friend Mike Height challenged me and disagreed with me, I think this is more of a personality race than it is an issues race. And it's going to pit uh, the personality of uh, Waltz versus Vance. Uh, one is likable. Uh, one is uh, is less so. Uh, if anything, if it does have an effect, it's going to be from the, the likability as opposed to issues. I do not believe anything is going to come out on the issue front that will change very many people's minds what about the second question bill <laughs> yeah i think they only we, answered one i think we all should engage in an occasional vice uh it's uh, it <laughs> invigorates life and makes it more excited so mr. So, uh, so i think the vice president should engage in vice a, mr schultz <laughs> uh, well first of all let me lead off by saying I have a set of ice grips. Does that work? It kind of. Um, <laughs> be careful, Larry. <No. laughs> All right. Um, I believe uh, that I agree with Bill. Um, I think uh, what I do when I watch a VP debate is say, can I imagine this person being president of the United States? And there have been times when it was pretty hard to imagine. Um, 
I can't remember right off the top of my – oh, Dan Quayle. I knew there was on your mind. Who couldn't spell potato, right? <laughs> and it's like, holy God. He was spelling right? potato. <laughs> yeah. and, a, guy, a guy makes one spelling error. <laughs> people make a big deal on that. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that could become a part of this. Uh, it's hard to say. There have been some – um, it's too bad they're not having the debate in a donut shop or a grocery store. That would give Waltz a decided advantage because <laughs> it seems like every time J.D. Vance goes to one of those retail food places, he has uh, some difficulties. But I think that's the issue. Not so much who's got the better program like you might do for a presidential debate, but can this person carry the load if something happens? And I think that's the main issue. Mr. Carl? Well, <clears throat> I will. Uh, I don't disagree with any of the comments so far, but I, I'll approach it uh, with my presumption that Trump's going to win the election. And so I'll be watching Vance for his you know, potential to become president uh, if something happens to Trump after, after uh, he's elected. Um, Considering there's been two assassination attempts and the entire government of Iran, yeah, and, and, and he's age and yeah, uh, there's health. a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so that that'll be the main you know focus that that I'll apply to to watching this. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, advances, you know, made made some uh, misstatements and bad, you know. But but I I I'm very I like the guy. I mean, I think he's He's. Uh, I like his his background and and uh, uh, so so I you know it, it his 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 potential to serve actually serve as president of the United States will be the main thing that I'll be watching for. Mr. Height. So I think that that us politi- political junkies look at things that way. We we look at, you know, if if they have to take the reins, will they be a good president? I don't know that everybody does. I think Bill may be right. It's more of a a personality type thing for the general public um that that aren't political junkies and they're looking, you know, from a a standpoint of of how nice are they? How presidential are they? Those types of things mean more. I don't know that the the vice presidential debates mean nearly as much as the presidential debates um, when it comes to to moving the needle. I think it does some. Um, the interesting thing about the polls right now is the national polls really don't matter a whole lot, in my opinion. Only only those states that are are purple in nature that that you know could go either way. Um, really matter. So, excuse me, and only certain counties in those states. Th- that's correct. That's correct. That th- most of it is already a foregone conclusion. You know, there are states like West Virginia we know is going to go red. It's it's a foregone conclusion, and I think the majority of states are already that like that. So you're looking at electoral college numbers at this point, and it is it is Pennsylvania and North Carolina and and states like that that are really going to make the difference. And, and that's why they're spending so much time in those states right now. And a vice presidential debate is going to move the needle a little bit. And I think that this debate is going to focus a lot on what – uh, what matters to the, the individuals in that state. And uh, so I think it's important how they react and how they behave, um, but I don't think it'll move the needle a whole bunch. And should they have a vice? Yes. I think they should start by <laughs> taking shots. Um, I think it'll make it for a much better debate. So, you know, uh, and maybe play shot bingo or something like that. Oh, beer pong. Yeah. 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 Every time somebody says a word or something, they take a shot. You know, yeah. I think it would, beer pong yeah. takes too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're terrible at it, you got to have good accuracy. Yeah, you got to have two or three hours to drink enough beers to really, you know. Yeah. What What was What was the last vice presidential debate that created a moment 
that made you recall that vice presidential debate? Can you think of? Yeah, uh, yeah the general a couple of years ago, and I've forgotten his name. Who was a very uh, uh, Admiral Stockdale? Yeah, Stockdale. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a yeah. very, very skilled, very capable uh, individual had achieved much. Very, it was intellectual, but yet bombed it through the debate and asked the question. What in the hell am I doing here? And then had the hearing aid moment. Yes, as well. Yeah. That was that was fascinating. That that was uh, that was probably pretty damaging to Ross Perot. Not that he was going to win the election, but as a third party candidate, he certainly created more attention than than most. Uh, if you go to Lloyd Benson with the Dan Quayle comment yeah. there. Uh, but generally speaking, that's the one I remember the most. I mean, these right? advice the presidential debates, I, I, I forget them almost as soon as they're over. That one, that one stands right? out. But, that, and, but that's the nature of the vice presidential debate. That, those are the only two I can recall where anything happened that makes you remember the debate. And, and you've got to go back to, the, to what, 1980, what was it? The second Clinton election was, was, 80, the, uh, was the... 88. And, well, 90. Five, I guess that for the for the Ross Perot moment, and then the you know the Benson Quayle thing was from around that time too. So I, I don't even remember any of the last several vice presidential debates. And it begs the question: Why do we have vice president debates? You know, the, I guess the Biden uh, there was a Biden vice presidential vice presidential debate where he interrupted the Republican about four was it rick ryan right he interrupted him about 150 times Mm -hmm. that i thought biden was just obnoxious throughout the course of the thing that kind of i guess i remember that because i just remember how obnoxious biden was during that debate but otherwise i there's i mean they kind of come and go and they're they're kind of nameless faceless people over the years you could pull out a list of of 10 people who've been vice president and i could quiz all of you at this table about them and you had no idea that they were the vice president yeah and you people are pretty informed Right. That's just how anonymous this position is. And that's a that's a good thing, given that the way you really get to know a vice president is if the president dies. Yes. <laughs> and so we've had that happen, but not very many times. Right. It, uh, you had compared this. to say some some countries uh, who lose their leaders uh, with fair regularity. Um, yeah. The last president to die in office from not being assassinated was FDR. After you know, you had Kennedy, of course, with the LBJ, but that was from assassination. So when you you look at the vice presidential candidates and you say, okay, well, this person is one heartbeat away from becoming president, it's still pretty rare yeah. when that actually happens. For the most part, you pay a lot of attention to the vice presidential pick when you speculate about who the nominee is going to be, and that creates a ton of attention. And then if there's a vice presidential debate, you pay a little bit less attention to that. And then... You forget about these people for the next four years until it's time to run again. With one exception, I think. Clinton Gore. Gore was very active and very visible through the Clinton administration. But I think he's the only one I can remember that did play a very active role. Yeah, he was probably a bit more present than the others yeah. in terms of yeah. when the news was taking place. But even even so, he, from what I understand, there were, there were several big-time meetings where he wasn't even there. So... And, and and now now that the con, you know that presidents can only serve two terms, mm-hmm. the prospect of the vice president succeeding you know has been cut in half basically. David, you were yeah, about to I say. Mean, yeah, I, I, I will say that uh, th- this debate will be important only in in the matters that that yeah we're. We, we saw Tim Walz get introduced uh, when, when he was chosen. We saw J.D. Vance get introduced. J.D. Vance has, has probably stepped in a little bit more than, than Tim Walz on the campaign trail. So we, we have a little bit more awareness of J.D. Vance. But this is kind of their, their ability to introduce themselves. Now, one, one incident I think we forgot was the, uh, the Mike Pence fly uh, from the last uh, <laughs> vice presidential debate, um, which was highly entertaining. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, J.D. Vance is probably going to have the advantage going into the debate because he's a lawyer. He's, he's, you know, got the debate experience. Uh, but Tim Walls is a, you know, I, I think he's got the, the likability on his side and that, uh, you know, if it becomes a personality debate, then I think Walls has the advantage. If it becomes a minutia debate, then one, we're all going to be falling asleep. And, but J, I think J.D. Vance will, will be okay in that, that realm. Um, but I, I think 
much like the presidential debate, I think Walls is going to try and get under J.D. Vance's skin, uh, much like Harris tried to get under uh, Donald Trump's skin. Um, as far as advice, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm good with, like, shot for answer. Um, or if they go over time, they have to take a shot. You know, just, you know, basically party fouls would be great. Uh, you know, they each have, like, a highball glass and, and uh, a cigar or something like that. Awesome. Those those would be great things. Also, I'll give you my favorite uh, vice president of all time is uh, the fourth vice president, uh, first vice president to serve under two different administrations, George Clinton, former governor of New York. Um, he served. He was the first one to die in office. When he died, he ascended to the mothership to become part of the P-Funk All-Stars. So, Sweet. That's, <laughs> yes. Funkad- Funkadelic, right? Parliament Funkadelic, Funkadelic yeah. George, George Clinton, yeah. atomic dog. Yeah. Hey, so why do we do a vice presidential debate? I mean, what, what is what is it we really want to know about these people in terms of what they can answer? Because it's not their policy that we're going to be following. It's not their wishes we're going to be following. It's for media ratings. I, well, and that that and it's there is to an extent. Are we comfortable if this person is forced to take over? I mean, that that's kind of the selling point of the vice presidential debate is that. In the rare case that something happens, we we, we kind of want to have we don't want just some dude that we were introduced to at a convention, uh, and and you know the the next time we see them is when they're taking the oath of office because something tragic has happened. Um, so there is some value to it, but yeah, I this isn't going to turn the race on its head. Um, you know, it's going to give the the presidential candidate some. You, you know, if, if both candidates do well, it's not going to change anything. If if one flubs completely, then then it might have some impact as far as you know, independent voters saying, "Do I really want that person?" And you know, in case the the vice presidential, you know, the, there's a promotion uh, in the works. Uh, so, and I think people might be looking at JD Vance a little bit more because of Donald Trump's advanced age. Uh, just as much as if Biden had stayed in the race, you know, again, taking another look at Harris as to whether she would have been uh, a good president. Now we we know that we have to kind of make that answer when we're going to the polls in November. But, um, you know, I think the, the age issue with Donald Trump and some of the, you know, curious stuff he's been doing on the campaign trail uh, will make the vice presidential debate a little bit more, I think, a little bit more important for the Republicans to establish that J.D. Vance's not quite the the weird guy that that uh, he's been made out to be on the on the campaign trail so far. And let's not forget, uh, as as a close a margin this race is going to be, eleven thousand votes may be just sitting there waiting, and eleven thousand votes made the uh, the difference last time. So we're yeah. not talking about we don't have to swing the needle very much. Swinging the needle just on a small, small, small amount might make a difference. It's also. One of the only choices when you have when you have two people um, who haven't who aren't currently the president, you get an opportunity to see in the vice presidential debate what the most significant judgment they've made up to now uh, in this cycle, at least. Uh, how good a judgment was it? And you know that's why misspelling potato kind of hurts hurts the ticket because it's like. Gee, the, you know the guy. You, you you don't have a guy who can spell. I mean, we're not asking you know super califragilistic expialidocious. We're just it's a potato. Um, we've all seen that word quite a few times. And so there are judgments that are made about the decision making of the top of the ticket. Larry, I got a text from the silent E lobby, and they are very offended by the abuse that you're giving Mr. Quayle, who is their uh, spokesperson. I bet he is. So the silent E Foundation is now protesting your presence on this program. Go ahead, David. You're about but, to say. I mean, yeah. Did it did it really impact? Like we think about some of the the, the big zingers of vice presidential debates. I mean, Stockdale wasn't ever going to to win vice president uh, in, in that race, but like Dan Quayle got nailed with the year no jack kennedy by lloyd benson and uh bush won anyway, handily in that yes. election so i i don't know that i i don't know even if there is a zinger in this debate that that you know 
that it will be the, the fatal coup de grace in, in this election. I agree. It's kind of like when we interview judges. They're just not allowed to say anything. You know, <laughs> that's, that's vice presidential candidates. It's, it's not your policy we're going to be following. Yeah. Right? It's, you're not the person in charge. What can you say? And that'll do it, David. Thank you for the leadoff. And we move on with the Admiral on the clock. Good morning. In studio, Lauren Schultz, attorney at law. Good morning, everyone. Burke Schultz, Harmon, and Jenkinson. Sergeant Michael Heights. Good morning. Great to be here. The senior member of our crew, the most tenured member of our crew, the man with the most longevity, Michael Carl. Great to be here. Great to have you. <laughs> yeah. Great. Did the cards make the playoffs? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They're, 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 my, my goal now is that they finish in sole possession of second place in the Central Division, and they're tied with the Cubs, but they have a tiebreaker on the Cubs. Let's go. My, my goal every year for the Pirates is that the owner sells the team. That's my goal. <laughs> every single year I'm disappointed because Didn't he doesn't. Didn't they just cut some guy who was like a couple of stats away from – uh, getting a giant bonus. Rowdy Tellez was his name. He played first base for the Pirates and DH on occasion this year. He was four bats shy of getting a $250,000 bonus, which is basically one game. It was at that moment that the general manager came out and said, we need to promote these two fellows from AAA to get them some playing time in the majors. Uh, we're going to go with a younger a uh, group of people here to close out the season. Tellez is 29. The guy that replaced him on the roster is 28. <laughs> it's a b- technically business. he's younger. Technically he's younger, Bill. Vicious. Yeah. With uh, issue number two, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Rob. This past week, uh, the Senate filibuster came into uh, notoriety again. Uh, Vice President Harris said, if elected, uh, she would like to do away with the filibuster to uh, uh, to promote to get some abortion language passed. Uh, this is nothing new. Every time there's, there is a administration, a president, and the Senate of the same party, the elimination of the filibuster comes into play. Uh, Donald Trump proposed it when his first two years in office. Uh, the reason it was not done in 2020 was Joe Manchin, who's very much against uh, doing away with the filibuster. In fact, Manchin said that he would not support, he would not endorse Harris because her stance with the filibuster. Uh, the filibuster is nothing new. In the very first uh, uh, Senate session in 1789, uh, it was complained that those damn Virginians talked away all the time, so nothing got done. And there's been some continuation of that. Uh, Strom Thurmond on one time talked over 24 hours, 24 hours and 18 minutes uh, to uh, uh, dis- uh to keep action from happening. And those days, if a filibuster was being, was being invoked, uh, no other business could be done. Uh, now you can go ahead and do other business as long as it's not the business of that particular subject of the filibuster. As a consequence, filibuster is being used all the time. Uh, the question to my, uh, my good friends and colleagues, and one other point is filibuster is not in the Constitution. It is a uh, it is a rule of the Senate. It the House does not have the same rule, so the Senate could do away with it, could retain it. Uh, Manchin makes the argument between uh, the Senate and the House that the uh, Senate is uh, deliberative, the House is more reactionary. Therefore, you need the uh, filibuster in the Senate. Uh, question to my colleagues: Should the Senate get rid of the filibuster? Let's start via telephone with Mr. Valente. Oh, it's such a bad idea to get rid of the uh, the Philadelphia filibuster because the um, well, it's a it's a minority protection within within the Senate. Um, I, I know I've said it on the for, uh, on the uh, on the show before that that uh, especially the Democratic Party likes to create the cudgels with which they are eventually beaten, and it's the idea that. Yeah, you know, it's it's like when when they changed the rules about how we voted for judges, and you know they did it out of convenience during the Obama administration. But then, what ended up happening happening is they they lost three different uh, uh, Supreme Court seats uh, during the Trump administration due to that rule. So, uh, getting rid of the filibuster may may be a you know a short term victory for a Harris administration, but. You know, as divided as as the the Senate is, and divided as as the 
American people are getting rid of the filibuster. Um, you know, she she's going to eventually face, you know, she may leave office or, or whatever, and a Republican takes office after her and has a Republican Senate, and whatever great idea she had to pass the for the filibuster uh, over the filibuster uh, could just be erased just like that. So I think the idea of getting rid of the filibuster just for a short-term political gain um, although our, our politicians never have much of a long-term vision when it comes to, to uh, political action, uh, is a very, very bad idea. It should be retained. It should be uh, protected. Um, and, uh, again, just this is a very bad idea. Michael Carl. <clears throat> well, I, I agree that we should not get rid of the filibuster uh, and partly – or mostly because it's 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 worked and and it's you know it's been part of the system for you know many many decades and it it uh it, it's it's just a a key you know limitation that requires a you know super majority uh to for something that needs senate approval and so i i I would not get rid of it because, because you know we've gotten used to it. It's worked for a long, long time, and changing something that fundamental uh, for just a you know limited purpose is wrong. Mr. Heights, yeah, I'm going to agree with David. Um, I, I think the filibuster needs to stay. It it does protect the minority, and and a lot of times when when you have the the, the executive and the Senate and the House all with one party. Um, the minority party needs something that they can push back on um, for important issues to them. Now, they're not going to do it in every issue, but um, they do need to have some protections um, in, in some areas. So I, I think it's it's very short-sighted to, uh, to try to eliminate this. Um, and uh, again, I agree with David that there are times you, you make these decisions and they come back to bite you, um, you know, when when the tables turn. And, and with politics in the United States, it uh, the the tide turns and, and sways the other way, and then you don't like the rule you've made. So uh, I think it needs to stay. Mr. Schultz, um, I don't think it should be retained, but I suspect that it will be. Um, uh, you know, I think it's always good to make a try. Remember, uh, it's not just for um, oppressed minorities that the filibuster has worked in the past. It's also for the fabulously wealthy and other pe and other minorities of our society that it has worked in the past. And so then it becomes a balance if you are making the judgment of whether to keep it. Who does it help more? And who does it hurt more uh, to have it in place? Um, so, yeah, there there are um, filibusters that have taken place that have uh, helped uh, racial minorities, and there are plenty of filibusters that have also taken place that have helped uh, financial minorities of the fabulously wealthy. And um, I I'm not sure that, that a sort of, oh, well, we're uh, an organization that votes on everything, but we ain't going to vote on this because I have the power to stop us from voting on it. Um, I'm not so sure we shouldn't just take the votes up or down and play it out as it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I would disagree uh, that it's something that always helps um, the lower economic classes and the uh, people who have um, faced discrimination it sometimes helps them. It often helps the very wealthy, too. So, Bill, comes back to you. I'll put yeah. my two cents in after I hear from you. Okay. Uh, Mike Carl made the point it has served us very well through our history, and it has served us very well through our history. Uh, the only thing that has changed is we're in such a polarized world right now. And if, uh, if we require a 60 vote to get something done, that means... Probably ten people, eight or nine people, have to cross 
political aisle and they there's no willingness to do that right now so there is more of a stagnation than what we've experienced through much of our history without the filibuster you could have a 50 50 senate that the vice president tie breaks and a 418 417 or sorry a 218 217 congress that technically gives the majority to one party throughout the two chambers and the white house so you could have a situation where the majority is tipped by one vote, yet that majority can get everything they want, no matter how extreme or how crazy. And it, it strikes me in an era where people are getting sick of personal attacks, where you see more and more people running away from office as opposed to running for it, which leads to many more aggressive candidates who are making more and more outlandish claims during their campaigns, burning down the village goodness be damned, it strikes me that the filibuster is the only thing that can keep, keep the crazies from taking over on either side. And without the filibuster, which guarantees there has to be at least some compromise if you want some of your stuff passed, I don't see any other way around the fact that because of simply having one extra person in the House and the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, that the other 49.99999 into infinite part of the country that isn't in that majority party right now, has no representation whatsoever. That strikes me as somehow unfair. I would keep the filibuster, and I would make sure that it can't be overturned or, or done away with. Fair enough. And, uh, how you would keep, how you would combat it, I posted in the chat, is that you actually do the talking filibuster. If somebody wants to filibuster something, you, hold, you make them hold the floor <laughs> and continue to talk and talk and talk until either they, they yield the floor or, you know, the, there's compromise made that allows them to yield the floor for whatever they, you know, whatever they're holding out for. You don't, uh, getting rid of the filibuster is just, I think it's a politically expedient way of uh, doing something that will eventually bite whoever does it, whoever eventually pulls the trigger on removing that rule. I would add one caveat to keep the filibuster, and that is if you're going to start a filibuster, you have to be, a certain younger age, because I can't have you needing to take a bathroom break in the middle of your filibuster. <laughs> right. Because that ends the filibuster. Yeah, and Strom Thurmond made his filibuster, <laughs> his 24-hour at the age, I think, uh, 70. He was uh, up early, there. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty impressive. All right, Bill, thank you. We go on to issue number three, and for that, Sergeant Michael Heights. I'm going to take my issue back to the state. Um, Governor Justice has called a special session for um, for this coming Sunday, Monday. Um and he has uh, 40 potential items on the call this particular time. It is a week before the regular interims. Um, so I guess my, my question to the panel is, is this merely an effort to garner more votes for his Senate campaign, or is there some legitimacy to this? To this. To the special session? To the special session, yes. All right. Do we, do we know what some of the items on the special <clears throat> session list are well, that would we, help us with the, we, we have, the motivation? We have heard about the extra 5% um, tax reduction, uh, to income tax reduction. Um, that's one of them. Um, there, a lot of them are, are spending uh, appropriations. Metro News reported um, child care was one of those issues. Child, child care is one of those issues, but there's there's a couple of, of child care things. There's like child care tax credits, those types of things. Some of those things, in my opinion, uh, and, and my personal opinion is special sessions should be only called for emergency situations. And when I look at what is on the call, um, I, I have to question each one. Is this an emergency? Could this not have waited till January uh, to take this up? And uh, many of those, even the child care issues, um, could have been taken up during regular session, in my, my opinion. One more question before we turn it over to the group here. Sure. How much, do we know how much money is on the table here that the governor wants to or, or want, recommends to be spent? Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 million. $800 million at stake. Admiral, you go first. Yeah, uh, Mike, you gave us a binary choice, uh, uh, legitimacy or the election. I don't think it's either one of those two. Uh, the election is, I, regardless of what others says, I think he has the election sold up. I think it's his 
he craves the spotlight. He wants to be in the center of things. He looks for any opportunity to do that. And the special session is one where the spotlight shifts to him. That does not speak to the legitimacy, uh, but it does speak to the fact that he that he always wants to be seen and heard. Larry? Um, yeah. I I can't think of a reason why we need to convene the legislature as expensive as that is um, in a special session to take up something that, first of all, could have been proposed in the past and it was proposed in the past and never dealt with. I, you know, there comes a point where I kind of want to say, oh, well, you didn't get your work done, so this one you ain't getting paid for. <laughs> and <laughs> obviously, Jim Justice is doing this to put a final piece of icing uh, and bolstering his chances of winning the Senate seat. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. Mr. Carl. <clears throat> well, uh, Bill kind of made a distinction. I don't think there's a distinction between uh, Justice's ego and his uh, affinity for putting out something that's you know that'll help help him gain votes or that'll help him in the election i think there's those are all the same uh and but i agree that that that, that that's what is leading to the to his call for the special session that's not you know in good government or he's likely to you know make some great improvements over what we have today or we're going to fix anything uh it's all it's all about uh, justice mr valente yeah, I mean this is this is all political theater for for justice to kind of preen and and peacock about you know uh, him doing something. Uh, nothing out of the call seems to be like a a like legacy defining moment. Even even the tax cut doesn't seem like it's just you know something that fifty years down the line we're going to be like wow he he did this special session right before an interim to to do this this tax that i i don't think people are going to remember it it's pure political for pointless reasons i mean he's i think he's pretty much sewn up the the senate seat which is uh, rather unfortunate but um you know maybe maybe he's going to resign and and uh install baby dog as as governor permanent governor of west virginia Hmm, that's an interesting proposition. <laughs> that might require another special session, and yeah. maybe not a legislative one. <laughs> uh, yeah, M Mike, kind of an adjunct to your question, where I thought you were going to go, is will the 5% uh, uh, tax cut that's been proposed by Justice, will that be favorably received by the legislators? Uh, well, I... I I certainly don't want to speak for 133 other people. Um, I, I will say... Um, I don't know that I'm in favor of it. I think there's a lot of things that, that need to be taken care of in the state of West Virginia still. Um, we're still trying to hash that out. Um, some things need to be cut, and, and we need to find revenue streams from cuts. Um, but there may be some thing. I, I still think we need to take care of teachers and, and state police and, and CPS workers. We've, we've come a long way in addressing some of those issues, but we're not finished. Um, so. I believe those are more important um, issues than some of the things that are, are on the call, and especially an additional 5% tax cut at this particular time. Just because we put triggers into effect with that, that are automatic, and as we reach certain um, some certain areas in revenue streams and as our economy is growing, they, they will automatically go into effect, and, and we don't need to to jump ahead and and possibly you know put ourselves in in financial trouble by by putting additional money in there so i i, I personally am against that um I, I know it's difficult for a republican to say i'm not in favor of a tax cut um, because normally we are and i am in favor of tax cuts um, but i think they have to be done responsible and i don't know that this is um, a, a responsible way to go about this I also I question why this weekend. Why why are you calling it for Monday when a week from that we're already in interims, 
and it's costing the the taxpayers an additional thirty five thousand dollars a day to call us down to, to Charleston, and that just does not make any sense to me. There is nothing on the call that I can see that is an emergency that has to be taken care of seven days prior to the interims. So um, I I don't know what his motivations are. I don't know if this is buying votes. I don't know what it is. I'll be honest with you. Um, But this is the second special session this year. And um, I just just question the uh, whether or not this is this is good governance. And you made the comment that Republicans against uh, that uh, that want to have tax cut. You are in fact are doing a tax cut because when the trigger kicked in, which something the Republicans voted for, you implemented another tax cut. Yes, the so automatic four percent. Automatic four percent. So all this is an additional five percent that's outside of the trigger. So I don't think a Republican can be accused of not being in favor of tax cuts by the actions. Oh, you've Bill, taken. you've been in politics long enough. Yes, we will. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That'll be the first ad created. If they put us on the call for that, you yeah. guaranteed whoever ever runs against one of us in the in the future we will be told we voted against a tax cut and and we will have so it'll happen that's just politics you have to be a willing to endure that those types of storms so 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 justice is helping uh, your future opponents if you vote against it, yeah. I guess, yeah. I mean, that's that's how ignominical he is. He doesn't care about the other people in his, quote, party. Well, you're, I know you're clearly not a fan of Governor Justice. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's um, been borne out through many statements that you've made. Uh, but still, so, uh, um, by the way, uh, Delegate Mike Hornby says it's $420 million. Mike, you, you, any thoughts on the well, there, discrepancy? There, no, there's... there's uh, there's two sets of of, of uh, proposals. One one is around uh, Mr. Hornby's number, Delegate Hornby's number, and then there's additional one for about 305. So if you if you add the two together, you're somewhere in between 700 and 800 million. 700 and 800 million. Okay. So uh, Patrick Morrissey has has uh, kind of hinted around and said that he would kind of prefer this happen during his administrations. So they had more time to go through the numbers to make sure that the state could afford this. But he said he's in favor of a tax cut because, of course, nobody wants to come out and say that they're against the tax cut. We, we sure, get that, right? right? Yeah. So uh, what if it, what if the governor wants to make sure this gets done because his initial goal he wanted, remember, was the 30% tax cut on the way to abolishing completely the state income tax. And with leadership changing, he wants to make sure that this gets done before he leaves office. Maybe he's got good intentions for this as opposed to Mike saying egomaniacal. Let, let's, let's remember, he called for a half a billion dollar increase in taxes his first time in office. Or his right. first, first, and, and it's in spite of, of his, you know, ego that the Republican leadership has caused these tax reductions that we've had and they were good but but eight years ago that was eight years ago what if he's seen the arrows ways and he's, he's changed he's not that person anymore if, if people if, can change if he if he would say that i would be stunned i will i will i said i'm i'm gonna defend him a little bit here okay um yeah 40 seconds was, for his defense it, it was it was through his leadership and the leadership of the legislature to put the 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 triggers and the and the original tax cut in place and make sure that eventually it will go away totally. So he's already done that. There's I, This is just to push it down the road a little quicker. I don't know why he needs to push it. He's already done the work. He signed the bill. He made it work. There will be no income tax eventually in West Virginia. Bill, did you hear this one? Yes, I did. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> you know that one? So there's a there's a line in here where uh, Phil Rizzuto is doing like a pseudo baseball play-by-play. Yeah. During a uh, heavy petting segment, as they used to say, <laughs> of the uh, of the song. And uh, true story, Phil Rizzuto, they asked him to do the voiceover, and he had no idea what it was for. And when the record came out and was a huge hit, and his Catholic priest at his church heard about the record and Phil Rizzuto's part in it, and he called him into his office to ask why he would lend his contributions to such a filthy song. <laughs> And Phil Rizzuto's like, I don't even know what he's talking about. I had no idea that they had put that inside that song. And uh, that's a true story there. Phil Rizzuto. 
Uh, by the way, uh, to pass this along, I got news of this last night. Uh, and in Hedgesville High School Eagles football put this out, and Colin forwarded to me. Matt Miller told me about it last night. Uh, ben Marica, who was uh, not only a teacher and a coach, but a true pillar of the Hedgesville community, uh, passed away, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, he was a father figure to a lot of people. He impacted so many. His dedication to this community, our school, and the young people he helped mold will never be forgotten. Our condolences go out to his family and friends. I had many, many interactions with Benny America when he coached Hedgesville's baseball team, called a ton of games, interviewed him many, many times. Just a great gentleman. Uh, he was a scout in this area for the Orioles uh, as well, I believe. And uh, true loss, just a wonderful person. Can't say enough good things about Ben Marica. And I know many people feel the same way. And Mike, I know you knew Ben too. And Amen. maybe yeah. others around the table did as well. But uh, just a, a great person. And we're sorry to lose him. I, as I said, I got the news last night. Matt Miller texted me that he had uh, passed away. So our condolences. Uh, we move on with issue number four. And with issue number four, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Yes, um, we've heard a lot of Republican blather about the weaponization of the Department of Justice, mostly because they were focused on Donald Trump's criminality. But now they've indicted a sitting U.S. Senator, Mr. Menendez, who's a Democrat from New Jersey, and the New York Mayor, Eric Adams, who's a Democrat mayor of New York. Perhaps I would suggest that a better explanation uh, than weaponization is the relatively high percentage of powerful criminals in the New York City area. And, of course, there's a name that I mentioned just earlier in this that uh, is, is one of the guys, and he's the one who keeps talking about it being weaponized. What does he say now? That's my question. There may be a better way to frame that question than just what does Donald Trump say now because we, we're not Donald Trump. Well, we can't what, speak on that. What do the weaponizer believers say now? There you go. Now? All right. There you go. We, I think we can answer that one there. Let's start with Michael Carl. Well, I, I will say that uh, it, it, it shouldn't be it, – it, it really implies how completely corrupt and criminal those – Two defendants are if if the if the Democrat you know uh, weaponizing uh, uh, Justice Department uh, goes after them, then then uh, they must be really uh, guilty and corrupt. Or an alternative is they're trying to change the discussion about their weaponization against Trump. Um, I'll just say that. Of these people we've mentioned today, only one of them has been convicted of 34 felonies. So, <laughs> you know, we might want to just give, dial give that it, whole give thing it time, back. Give it time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, uh, they're innocent until proven guilty. But that leaves one guy who's not innocent because he has been proven guilty. Mr. Height, you seem engaged already. Go right ahead. So, so <laughs> I, I'm, first I'm going to say, Larry, you have a, a legitimate – question this is very legitimate so although i i'm gonna have to agree with mike it says a lot about how bad these two must be if if the democratic uh, uh political machine up there in the doj is coming after them and and i say that because that particular that particular doj well that particular prosecuting uh attorney up there ran his whole campaign was about taking down Donald Trump about trying Donald Trump he was going to find something that that he could tr and this is and and what he tried him over were things that others had turned away so we're not good there's not enough evidence here this there's not enough to to try this man on we're going to pass on it and yet his whole campaign was I am going to go get Donald Trump and, and and he did. So I don't know how you can say that's not weaponization of the DOJ. That was his whole campaign was to go after a, a political opponent. Now, these these other ones, they must be pretty bad. This is the first time her hearing of the, the mayor of New York being being corrupt and, and the things that they're accusing of. This must be pretty bad and pretty damaging. Now he's coming out and saying, I told you when I ran, they were going to come after me. 
that that I was going to be a target. Well, it it's it's the your own left that's coming after you. So yeah, I don't know why he would be saying things like this if if they weren't true. Uh, Menendez, he's been under investigation for a long time, and and just finally um, they're they're getting him for for what he's been doing for a long time. So I'm not surprised there. And as a, uh, for the comment about the the high level criminals in New York, really? I mean that as long as New York's been there, that's been the case. So that's not surprising at all. Just one procedural point. Uh, these are just early stage, you know, prosecutions. But Trump's is not in the final stage. It is not final. It is not legally final. And I'll bet anybody they'll be reversed. Mr. Valente. Yeah, uh, I mean, one point, uh, Menendez was actually convicted in July, so he's also a convict as well until, well, he's not been sentenced, but he, he's on, on the train as well with, with Donald Trump. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there there's a, a nice number of, well, probably not nice, but uh, a number of criminal people who have risen to power in the New York area. I mean, um, uh, George... Uh, uh, with the, the the congressman who I can't remember his last name Santos um, Santos yeah Santos yeah George Santos uh, you know Elliot Spitzer was in trouble before he resigned um, you know there it's not a it's not a new thing and and you know as a prosecutor yeah maybe he did run on on going after Trump but I think corrup- corruption was a big thing with this guy and I I don't think he it's a far stretch to say. He is going. He's going to do what he wants to do to to root out corruption in in New York City, which uh, seems rather rife. The, the, we should clarify one thing: nobody gets to run to run the DOJ's office in New York. It's not an election. The guy who yeah. ran and promised to go after Trump was a state prosecutor who carried through. Obviously, I I think that not only Donald Trump, but a lot of other people have done the sorts of things that Mr. Trump was prosecuted for and had has been ignored by local government because they were powerful. Uh, but this, the DOJ is not ignoring it, no matter what letter follows your name. And that, that's kind of hurting, I think, Donald Trump's constant claims uh, that he must be innocent because they've weaponized the justice system. Bill? But to yeah. your point, what you said with, with Trump, Trump, what will Trump say? Trump will, uh, the truth be damned, he's he's going to continue to say the D- DOJ is weaponized. There's never gonna, not going to be any change to that, and, and I think his followers are going to say the same thing. Bill? Yeah, it's unfortunate that we, uh, we put political, find everything in political terms. Uh, what happened in the old days, whether someone is guilty or innocent, and that's been lost now, uh, because if, if you been charged something it's not my fault i'm innocent it's all weaponization uh but those political labels have been around for uh, for a long time uh most recently with supreme court with the warren uh warren supreme court was an activist court the republicans said this all the time uh and now with the roberts court it's the other party that's saying it it's the uh the roberts court is now an activist court uh it's all it's convenient politically labeling uh i I uh, I do not think that DOJ has been weaponized. Uh, by the same token, I don't believe the deep state within our federal government uh, is a is uh, uh, philosophically directed against any one party. Those folks are there to do their job. We need to give them credit for doing the job. Uh, I uh, I do not have a lot of patience for any of this political labeling. I like the way you close that, Admiral. Yeah. So when you talk about deep state, you're talking about their incompetences on both sides. Mike, I I don't see their the incompetence. I see a lot of professionals. Uh, most of what you hear about from the federal government are political appointees that are brought in. The civil servants are there to do their job. They have blinders on generally when it comes to politics, and they do the job very professionally. I don't disagree. I, I, when I talk about incompetence, I talk about it at the top. 
You know, when we talk about the Secret Service and how it's in disarray right now, it's because of the people at the top, not not the actual agents. And with that, we move on to issue number five and Mr. Michael Carl. I want to uh, bring up uh, something that uh, sort of in my field, professional field, but but goes beyond. Trump's 2017 tax reduction was widespread in terms of all the the you know the different uh, brackets you know, or rate levels mm-hmm. that were reduced, uh, and it, it it applied to in a free enterprise system, and because of that, it actually raised federal tax revenues. Now there were deficits because they spent too much, but it raised revenues. Do you think Kamala Harris understands any of that? So, uh, what is Kamala Harris's uh, economic what, does, does she, background? Does she understand those? those she understand the, economics. The, those principles that, that when you cut tax rates, income tax income tax rates in, in, a, in a free enterprise system, you raise government revenue. Right. Does she understand that? Uh, as, as none of us here is her, we can't actually speak to what she understands, but we can speculate, Bill Stubblefield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Trump, Based on what she said. Yeah. Uh, Trump's uh, uh, 2017 uh, uh, tax cuts uh, were, were a victim of COVID because they, had, they really increased uh, COVID. The result was a $4 trillion uh, increase in a deficit. However, before COVID hit, uh, the uh, uh, CBO and other and various economists said this was a a bad move in terms of our long term uh, uh, long term debt, and that proved to be the case. Now, going back to what we're seeing today, uh, Wall Street Journal uh, is looked at what. Uh, Harris is proposing and what Trump is proposing. They see Trump's uh, proposal are going to increase the deficit by a couple of trillion dollars. Uh, Harris's proposal increased the deficit by uh, uh, around seven to eight hundred million dollars. Uh, so there's uh, so Wall Street Journal has passed judgment and said that they, she, they think that Harris's proposal is more economically sound than what Trump's proposing. Eight, seven or eight hundred billion or seven Seven hundred hundred million. I said, but I said, may I meant billion. billion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because eight hundred million yeah. to the federal government. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah, market change. That's <laughs> like a no, West Virginia the, tax cut. The, the point is, it's substantially <laughs> less than the, uh, uh, the yeah. Trump proposal. Gotcha. Yeah, the the entire uh, increase in the national debt during the Trump administration was eight point two billion, from the research that I've done. Larry Schultz. Billion I'm or sorry, trillion? I'm sorry, trillion. <laughs> Bill's got me going now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reducing to the next billion. All right. Um, there is still debate. It is not a settled fact that those 2017 federal income tax raised U.S. government uh, tax revenues. There is a debate about that. And there's definitely a debate about whether or not they were as widespread and top to bottom as, be, as is being suggested here. They were mostly tax cuts for the very wealthy. Um, and... Um, like I say, economists, there are plenty of degreed economists who know more about this probably than any of us, um, who will tell you, no, it didn't, and uh, it didn't raise revenues. And then we turned around and told everyone that COVID would be over in 15 days and ended up running $8.2 trillion in deficits which I think is a four-year record it for is. the United States president. It's not a record as a percentage, but it is as a gross amount. Yeah. Um, so in any event, um, I guess what I would say is that is not accepted by a, a large percentage of the people whose job it is to do that analysis. It's not as easily uh, passed off as all that. But re- regardless, um, there are definitely difficulties. Um, you know, as a result, the people who got their taxes paid didn't pay extra money in order to help the country get past COVID. And that includes Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and the rest of them. They didn't pay extra money, even though the U.S. government spent 
billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, trying to help this economy uh, land back on its feet. Um, that's not necessarily what the average American wants to see. Um, Elon Musk getting a tax cut while everybody else stays about the same or gets uh, a much smaller tax cut. That's not what they want to see. They want to see, I think, the average American wants to see those people pay their fair share like they used to under the old progressive tax system. Um, we're going to find out. I think this election is about some of that stuff. David Valente. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the point of the question, I don't trust either one of them to really understand anything when it comes to economics. Uh, you know, yeah, they, they passed a tax cut, but then, you know, Donald Trump is all about tariffs, and ta tariffs are just taxes that, that we pay um, because we, you know, we're, we're trying to provide some protection protectionist uh, maneuvers in, in whatever industry we're, we're putting them in. So, um, and, and when we look at everything that happened from 2017 on, you can factor in the COVID, you can factor in the stimulus, the market liquidity that, that added. We're, we're facing the uh, results of that with, that, with everything that's happened since 2017 at the grocery store because, you know, you're, you're paying – you know, 50% more than you did a couple of years ago because we've devalued the dollar. We've devalued, um, you know, we've, we've taken on so much debt in this country that, that, uh, we, we don't have an ability to, uh, really rein in inflation without, you know, just doing all sorts of machinations to, to try and stop that. So, I, yes, I mean, I think whenever you do a tax cut, you're going to see an increase in revenue. It's counterintuitive, but it's, you know, it's explained in that uh, you're not seeing as much, uh, uh, you know, tax attorneys trying to, uh, or uh, tax professionals trying to take uh, gains and, and things like that. They, they're still trying to f figure out the law that way. Plus, it incentivizes actually uh uh, paying the the taxes that you're now being charged. So, and we're also seeing, you know, that that tax cut included some some corporate tax relief that allowed uh, repatriation of of uh, income from from foreign sources. So, uh, it's it's a short term game. Uh, now, I'm I'm all in favor of, of tax cuts, and and but you got to also have the the spending cuts to to match it so that, that uh, you're not really burning the candle at both ends. Michael Heights. So let me just say, I grew up in a middle-class family, and um, that's pretty much the Harris plan right there. I grew up in a middle-class family. That's all I've ever heard. So I don't know where the Wall Street <laughs> Journal is coming up with the Harris economic plan. Um, she doesn't have a plan. So I don't know how it's being uh, – debated against the trump plan we know what trump will do he's already been in office we know what harris will do because she's been the vice president for the past three and a half four years and it's just a, a continuation of the biden plan so and 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 twice in this particular show larry has condemned the ultra wealthy that one percent that pays over 50% of all taxes, and then to say they don't pay their, their fair share. And, Bill, I'm here to, to defend you as one of that 1%. <laughs> all right? No, He's been attacking you this whole show. Um, You're looking the wrong man. It's Bill Stroud, not me. <laughs> so, so when you say they're not paying their fair share, I don't know how you can say that when that 1% is paying 50% of all the taxes. You know, and, and, and nobody ever wants to define what fair share is when they make that comment. Fair share. How much is fair share when when they they provide 50 or 60 percent of all they make? Is that their fair share? What's the fair share? Now, they're already paying more in taxes than anybody else. So why should they have to pay even more and more and more a, a, in a progressive way? I, I, I think they're already overtaxed. And I, I think the the Trump cuts in 2017, um, I believe, were working until COVID hit, and then COVID destroyed any everything, and and there were trillions of dollars spent to try to uh, uh, abate the the 
the the disease that was sent over here from from China that we paid for. So, you know, I, I don't blame all of the the economic troubles that happened in 2020, 2021 on Trump. Mr. Carl, you have 30 seconds to wrap it up. I'll div- I'll give all my 30 seconds to saying amen to what Mike just said. <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better. He made all the right points. You mean his defense of Bill Stubblefield? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 his defense of the tax cuts and, they, and the fact that they, they raised revenue in a free enterprise system, and it was COVID that changed everything. Final thoughts, we start with David Valenti via telephone. Go. Hey, uh, Berkeley County Pride this weekend, downtown Martinsburg. Come on out. Mr. Larry Schultz. Uh, good luck to Mr. Ferretti and everyone else. Be careful about the wind and rain that's uh, going to be coming through. William. Yeah, uh, don't complain about the rain. We need it. Mr. Carl. Go Cards finishing sole possession of second place. Mr. Height. Yep, just try to stay dry. It's going to be wet for a week or so. Thank you to our uh, producer, the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, to all of our panelists and you folks for watching and listening every Friday. We appreciate your loyalty on that. The Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio.